Thank you for joining us today here at Curtis Baptist Church. I am starting a new series today entitled Radical Impact, A Life Worth Living. What this series is going to accomplish, it's going to give the believer the confidence to understand and know that God wants to work through your life to impact the world wherever he's placed you. And so this is important. So often we fail to realize how much God wants to work through us. We lack the confidence to know how to go forward, how to make a difference. But from God's word and under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, I think you're going to find a refreshing new energy, vision, and desire to impact your world for Christ. So we're excited to begin this message and the series today beginning in Ephesians chapter 4, the first six verses. So get your Bibles, prepare your heart. God has something great to show you as he desires to work through you. Well, good morning. Thank you for joining us this morning. 2021, it's here. It's time to start a new year. And we want to start it off right with the Lord this morning. And I want to start it off with this reminder that there's nothing that God cannot do in your life and through you if you would submit your life to him. So we're going to sing this truth this morning that there's nothing that God can't do and also you proclaim it with your whole heart this morning. Can you do that for me? All right, let's sing this together. Sing just one word. Just one word You calm the storm that surrounds me Just one word Darkness has to retreat. Just one touch, just one touch. I feel the presence of heaven. Just one touch, my eyes are open to see. My heart can't help but believe. See, there's nothing that I God can do. It's not a mountain that He can. Sing just one, just one word. You hear what's broken inside me. Just one word, and you revive every dream. Just one touch, just one touch. I feel the power of heaven. Just one touch. Sing this together. I will believe. I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise. Let all agree. There's no power like the power of Jesus. I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power. Let faith arise, let all agree, there's no power like the power of Jesus. I will believe for greater things, there's no power like the power of Jesus. So let faith arise, let all agree, there's no power like His power, there's nothing that I got. That he can move. Oh, 
Sing how deep and how deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure that He should give His only Son to make a wretch His treasure. Sing how great. How great the pain of searing loss The Father turns His face away As wounds which mar the chosen one Bring many sons to glory
Take your Bibles, please, and turn to the fourth chapter of Ephesians. We're going to be reading verses 1 through 6 this morning. And would you stand with me in honor of reading God's Word together? Ephesians 4, 1 through 6. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the truth of your word and the power that it has to change lives. And Lord, today... As we look at this passage together, and Brother Mark uh, proclaims the truth, Lord, may it be an encouragement to us, as well as a challenge and a motivation for us to see how you desire to use each and every one of us for your honor and for your glory. Father, we lift up those who are unable to be here today. We pray that you would comfort them and encourage them today. Help them to realize that you are with them wherever they are and that your comfort is for them. Lord, I pray that they would be restored to us very soon. Lord, we pray for our country. We pray, Lord, that, uh, that you would be honored and glorified in this nation. Father, we ask you to do a great work that only you can do by the power of your Spirit. Lord, open our ears and our hearts to you now as we hear the Word of God proclaimed. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Tom, for reading God's Word. Church, I want us to focus in this morning on these first six verses in Ephesians 4. This particular text will be the text we use to launch a brand new series entitled Radical Impact, A Life Worth Living. I think one of the great challenges in the Christian faith is that we come to know Christ, somebody uh, God uses an instrument to see our lives change. They tell us the truth. They tell us, help us understand as a sinner there is salvation in Jesus. Our life is radically changed. We have peace and forgiveness But then we begin down our journey and cannot figure out sometimes how God desires to use us to pass that truth on to others, to be an instrument in His work. How does that really happen? Can He really use me in that way? And I think those are very valid questions. I've wrestled with those. Probably you've wrestled with those in your life. um, And they are real. But I'm here to tell you, not just today, but over the next several months, we're going to see from the Scriptures exactly how God is longing to work through your life. And not that you just see it, but I believe with all of my heart in the months ahead, you're going to experience that in a powerful way. If you will take God's Word and you'll apply it in your life, you'll begin to, God's going to open up doors for you. He's going to open up relationships for you to see other people come to know Christ as their Savior. And it's going to be incredible. Now, we've studied Uh, This past semester in 2020, we studied the life of Peter, and we saw how uh, he finally got to the point of living radical for the Lord. But now we're going to see not just that it can happen for Peter, but it can happen for us. So we're really going to, in some ways, not just say we're going to study a biblical character, but we're going to study ourselves. We're going to say, how can God uh, work through my life so that I can live radical for the Lord? 
And that is the essence of this title, Radical Impact, A Life Worth Living. Peter would have told you once he got to that point, this is a life worth living. And I want to encourage you in the same way that if you'll live by God's Word, it is a life worth living. The purpose of this <coughs> particular uh, sermon series is simply going to be to understand the connection between relationships and making disciples. It's really that simple. Because life is about relationships first with God, then with others. And if we understand relationships, then we can understand how to make disciples. So write that down. This is going to be an understanding of the connection between relationships and making disciples. We're going to understand that uh, if that's our purpose, our goal is going to be to walk with God, to make sure our relationship's right with Him, and then to understand and be at peace in our relationships and our family and with others, and then to then go forth and impact the world when we see it sequentially that way. God, others, impact. This is what happened for Peter, and this is what can happen for us. So if you can kind of take that in, for an understanding of what we're going to be working on in the months ahead, I think you're going to uh, flourish. Maybe for some, like never before. And for others who've walked there, it's going to be a renewal for you or a reminder for you to continue to do so because it's definitely a life worth living. So today I've entitled the message, To Live Radical. I'm laying down a foundation here out of Ephesians, which will help us um, in the study as a whole. Uh, we're going to see personally that there is a responsibility that we have in these first six verses and how we live. Next week, we're going to understand how we connect in the church to go forward. You're going to see my responsibility in uh, being called to help equip you to be all that God wants you to be next week. We'll see that. But today, we're going to see to live radical, there is some personal responsibility that needs to take place. I want to point out before we jump into the text, in verse 3, if you'll look in verse 3, it says, make every effort to keep the unity, uh, if you will underline, highlight that word, the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Really where uh, Paul is going here, what God is communicating through Paul is this, is that it's all about the unity. That is the intent of everything that is being said is to bring unity, unity in the church, so that we can accomplish God's will. I, I don't really know this coach personally or his life, but I like something he said, that's Herman Edwards, on the thought about team unity. He said, the players that play on this football team, he said, will play for the name on the side of the helmet, not the name on the back of the jersey. I like that. Did you know too many believers are playing for the name on the back of their jersey instead of playing for God's name? Instead of living for God's name, not playing, but living, yes? How many of us have been more concerned about our reputation, more concerned about our vision, about our ministry, than we are about His glory, His ministry, His will, His way, not ours? If there's one thing we're going to understand when you understand unity, this is about God and His church. It's not about us. And so if we're going to live radical, there are three things I want us to see in this text that are laid out that begin to lay the foundation for us. There are three. The first is simply this. There is the expected expectation in verse 1. Let me read the text. It says this. Paul is writing here, says, a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. It is the second part of the verse that is the urging. It is the second part of the verse that he is just laying it out there, and he's saying, listen, I am urging you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Really what that's saying is simply this, that there is a personal responsibility that you and I have as believers in Christ. We don't just believe in Christ and everything's great. No, there is a personal responsibility that comes with believing in Christ. This is the expected expectation, which is to live a certain way. It just simply means that. There's a certain way that you and I are called to live as believers. What is that certain way? 
Well, it is to live worthy of the calling you have received. When you came to Christ, yes, your sins were forgiven, but there was a calling placed on your life. Think about it like this. If you join a sports team, or say you go and you join an organization or a club, typically there are some ground rules, there are some expectations, there are some things that you've got to do if you're going to be a part of that group. You understand what I mean? Uh, there's a certain attitude, there's a certain goal, there's certain sayings that are, that are brought to you that, that you are to memorize and to focus on and dwell on in order to accomplish the goal. That, that's kind of typical of any organization, club, or team that you join. Those could be considered expectations that are placed on you. Well, if we can understand it in that arena, we should understand it in becoming a believer in Christ that there are some expected expectations. Why am I drilling down on this? Because too many people have prayed a prayer, received Christ, and never moved beyond that. They've secured heaven, but they've never taken upon themselves a calling that has expectations connected to it. You, you know what I mean? Uh, so, so you receive Christ, you pray a prayer, walk an aisle, fill out a card, whatever it is that uh, uh, says to you that you've come to know Christ, but then you walk away with zero expectations. The Bible says that's not the case. Jesus, he, he preached this. He said, listen, when you come to me, you are coming to follow me, to be a follower of Christ. And to be a disciple is to sit at the feet of Jesus and learn. And all that is learned is then is to put it, be put into application as you follow Jesus with your life. So the disciple part is the learning where you understand what the expected expectation is going to be so that as you follow, you know how to follow correctly in how you live, where you go, what you say, what you do, all of that. So there is this expected expectation on us as believers when we come to a new life in Christ. You get that? It's true. So let's break it down, the second part of that verse. There are three major parts. It says to live a life, and then there's worthy, and then there's the calling. When you look at this part where he says to live a life, he is emphasizing here the fact that uh, that word live can also mean walk. It's how you walk. It's uh, how you live. Um, in, in the NIV, it translate this, translates this live, or you can translate it walk. It's either or. It's fine. This is both in our attitudes and our actions. It just means we are here, and we are to take into account what we're thinking, which is our attitude, which we, we, we change that by God's Word, by meditating on God's Word, by taking His Word in, so that the attitude of the heart, the perspective that we have, okay, attitude then uh, influences action, the things we say, the things we do. And so that is what culminates to live a life. And then he says, in living that, it is to be worthy. This word simply means equal weight. You ever go to the weight room and you pick up a big set of weights and uh, say you're going to bench press, and say you put 50 on one side and 75 on the other side, you would be unbalanced, and you would feel that. But if you put 50 on one side and 50 on the other side, plus your bar, then, then you have a balanced approach, okay? Worthy simply means that. It means equal weight. It means your calling and your conduct should be balanced. So if your calling is on one side of the bar and your conduct is on the other, the two match so that it's equally weighted. It simply means you're worthy. And if we're going to live a worthy life before the Lord, it will not be about our performance, but it only comes in surrender. It comes in surrender. And so if we understand this, we can begin to live every day anew worthy of the calling. What a great way to start a new year right? To get up and say, listen, there's an expected expectation on me. I am to live my life both in attitude and action, and I am to have equal weight, both my calling and my conduct equally laid out, and I start today in this new way, fulfilling the calling God has put on my life. Can I do it? The answer is yes, you can do it, because there is something different about you. You have something other people do not have. You have the Holy Spirit that is in you that you got. 
and you receive that salvation. You have a, a, a way to connect with God. You have access to God through Jesus. Your sins have been forgiven. You have the Holy Spirit which will lead you. There is something different about you than other people. It is the fact that you are a child of God. So with that being said, uh, we get to not uh, just exist. We live differently so we can make a difference. And that's just the truth of the matter. Quit selling yourself short. Don't think that you can't do it. God's waiting to do something through you, impactful for his kingdom. And we've got to own that. We've got to live in its reality. So attitude and action, your calling and your conduct that are equally balanced, all of that leading to an understanding of what the calling is. So he says, live a life worthy of the calling. This calling is both to your salvation and your life after your salvation, which is your connection to the church. We're going to see this clearly in the full uh, verses in Ephesians 4, and especially next week. You've got a personal responsibility. We're going to look at it in just a second. You and I both do. But then we have this church responsibility. And this is the one that so often people uh, fail to focus on. Uh, we live in a culture where it's not valued. Uh, we live in a culture, listen, I see it, I observe it, I hear people talk about it. We are living in a culture that says, I know God, I'll have a connection with God on my terms, but to connect with the church, I'm not sure it's needed. I will attend worship, I will raise my hands, I will give to the Lord, and I will worship Him, but I will not connect with the church. To not connect in the body of Christ is an absolute violation of everything that is so clearly laid out in Scripture. And it's not just happened overnight. It's been this gradual shift away from the importance of the church as the body of Christ, the bride of Jesus, the one that Jesus died for and established. And if we don't take that up, and we don't depend on one another. We cannot be the church. We cannot go out into the world and make an impact. And my heart breaks over those who've been convinced they can do God, do life, do salvation without the church because we're missing the critical peace that God has given us. The beauty of being in the church. So we have this personal responsibility, yes, we're going to see, but there is a church responsibility as well, the body of Christ. I want to give you four things that you can work on this coming year that touch on both your personal life and your church life, your personal responsibility and your church responsibility. These are very simple, but you should write these down. Many of you know these. Many of you thought about this. It's nothing revolutionary, but it's very basic. You should write this down. My personal relationship with God. It's just that simple. Where is it? If that's not there, you're going to struggle in every other aspect of the Christian life. You've got to have the personal relationship with God through Jesus under the leadership of the Holy Spirit. The second thing you've got to evaluate is my personal responsibility at home. God has given you lifelong, forever relationships that you cannot escape, you must embrace. We've said it here. We'll keep saying it. If we can build strong homes, we can build a strong church. What God desires for the spiritual leadership to do in the home, we can't do. You're there to do it. You're there night and day. You are the one leading. You are the one that God has given the influence and the strength and the power. And so those are relationships. Once your relationship with God is right, then you can lead in your home. And then, after leading in your home, then you can take up what the Scripture says your responsibility is in the church to other believers. We'll talk specifically about that next week. But you have a responsibility. So if we negate that piece, though, the church piece, or we negate the home piece, or we negate the personal piece, we will never get down to this fourth piece, which is simply that we are called to impact, have spiritual impact in the world. Too often we want to jump to number four and say, all right, guys, here we go. We're going to impact the world. We're going to do this and we're going to do that. And we fail to realize that if we're not connected in personal relationship, 
if we're not doing what we're supposed to do in responsibility to the home, and if we're not doing what we're supposed to do in the church, the fourth, that final impact into the world is not going to be what it needs to be. So we have to make a choice every day to live in the expected expectation of our personal walk with God, to live a life worthy of the calling so that these other things can fall into place. You say, what are those other things? Once I take up the calling, I receive that, and I live in a worthy way in how I live my life. Well, here it is. Here it is. Verse 2 and 3, the clear responsibilities that are placed on me and on you as believers in Christ. That club, that, that organization, that team you join, they say, well, well here, you know, here are the things we need you to do if you're going to be a part. In essence, if you can think along those lines, here are the things that we are to do as believers in Christ. Verses 2 and 3. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Just two verses. Very simple. What this is is five inner attitudes that are characteristic of the heart of a believer who is surrendered and growing. They're right here. This is what I'm to do. And ultimately, if I do these things, it will lead to unity in the church. It will lead to unity in my home as I take up this calling that has been placed on my life. I am called, you are called to be humble. That's right, you. You are called to be humble. May I ask you a question? If you were to ask your mate, if you were to ask your children, am I a humble person? What kind of response would they give you? Because that's probably where you would get the clearest answer if they were truly honest about the type of person you really are. Now, I'm not trying to put you in a tough spot, but if we look and we see that there is room to improve in this area, we should, we must, we have to. we got to be humble. What does that mean? It means to be other-focused, not self-focused. It's real simple. When Jesus came, he came in humility. You can see that in Philippians chapter 2. He came to serve and not be served. What a great testimony is if someone says of you, you're a servant, not because you're performing, but because you understand the value of what you're called to, to be humble and to give to others, to not be focused on yourself, but focused on others in the simplest ways. What you do for your mate, what you do for your kids, what you do for coworkers, what you do for others. Let me tell you something. When you're in a state of humility and service, you have died to self and you can live for other people because you're taking up your calling. You say, ah, oh, just, oh, I want my way. Listen, it's not about your way. It's about God's way. But I want this and I want it now. It could be as simple as you're sitting on the couch and you want something so you'll manipulate to get what you want so you don't have to get up to go get it. Some of y'all relate to that. I relate to it. Listen, the, the, the human flesh and spirit is powerful. And I'm not saying people can't give to you or do something for you or even be asked for somebody to do something. But is there a consistent pattern that it's got to be about you? If that's the case, then more than likely, you're not walking in the humility you've been called to. Warren Wiersbe's definition goes this way. He says, humility means putting Christ first, others second, and self last. That's true humility. You and I, we are called to be humble. Write it down. Don't forget it. It's true. Secondly, I am called to be gentle. What does this mean? It means don't be abrasive, but be supportive. It is the opposite of self-assertion, rudeness, and, and, and harshness. It means to come alongside someone else and support them, to be gentle with them. Are you rough on people? People that aren't around, do you speak rough about them? Or are you called to support other believers when they're not all that they need to be? Could you be that support? I believe we can. I believe it's one of the great areas that we've got to learn to uh, be gracious toward one another in. And that is how we talk about one another, how we come alongside one another. We need to learn to be gentle with each other. 
I'm called to be humble. I'm called to be gentle. And guess what? I'm also called to be patient. (laughs) Patience. It's one of the fruits of the Spirit. Simply means don't be demanding, but be supportive. Hmm. This word is also long, can be translated long suffering, which literally means long tempered. It's the ability to endure discomfort without fighting back. Something comes your way that you're not in agreement with, or you don't like the way it is. Do you fight back, or do you have long suffering toward that person? Can you be patient with that person? You say, I don't know. I'm going to say, yes, you can. Because there's something different about you. You've been saved. The Holy Spirit's in you. If the truth of God's in you, you understand your expected expectation to be patient. You can pray about that, and God will grant the patience that you need to work with others at that very moment. The ability to be humble, gentle, patient. How about the next? I am called to be loving. It says to bear with others. To bear with them. Bearing with one another in love means simply to work with them through life's issues for their good. I asked myself this question. I wrote it down so I could ask it to you as well. Mark, who are you bearing down on, not bearing with? Who am I just on? Bearing down on them, not bearing with them. See, there's a difference. There is a difference. You know the reason I love this one about this uh, call to be loving, to bear with others in love? Because it's an indication to me that the believer, believers are in process. You're not perfect and I'm not perfect. I'm so grateful for those who bear with me. By the power of God, it's so needed. Listen, I want to come alongside you and bear with you not bear down on you. I want to believe God's best for you. I want to believe God can do it. You're not perfect and I'm not either. We're all in process. So I'm called to be loving. And then, verse, then the fifth one is simply this. I am called to be unifying. I am to make every effort through the Spirit, and only the Spirit resides as it needs to when I'm in surrender, through the Spirit to bring unity through peaceful actions. Yes. Beautiful. See, too often we focus on uniformity, not unity. Uniformity is the outside appearance that everyone is together, but true unity is an internal grace that comes by God in us, worked in and through us, bringing unity. When you or I are living out these Christian virtues... Here they are. When I live, just just understand this, when I live humble, when I live gentle, patient, loving, and unifying, at that moment, at that moment, listen, I am living a life worthy, calling and conduct equally balanced like a set of weights. I am living worthy of the calling these things on my life. And I'm not capable of any of these things, any of them. I, I, I cannot be humble. I don't know really how to be gentle. Man, I grew up for sure I didn't have any patience. Loving, what is that? Unifying? I, I could create disunity quicker than anything in the flesh. But in the spirit and in surrender, Cannot take credit for humility. Cannot take credit for being gentle or patient or loving or unifying. But all of it works as I fulfill the calling and and walk, live in a worthy manner. You see it? It's beautiful. That's living radical. That's a life worth living. It is selfless, not selfish. It is surrendered, not rebellious. It is living truth, not just claiming truth. Lifestyle, not just an experience. It's who we are. I've often had to coach myself around the house sometimes when I didn't want to do chores around the house. Say I need to go out and cut the grass. You got to do the weeding, pull the weeds, cut the grass, do all that. You know, and, and maybe I didn't want to do it. And I'll coach myself, and I'll say, well, Mark, 
Nobody's coming up here to do it for you. You might as well go out there and do it. And I've had my kids say to me, Dad, are you talking to yourself? I'm like, yes, I am. <laughs> I am talking to myself, but I haven't answered myself yet. But I have to tell myself, this is my responsibility. Nobody's coming over here to do this for me. You're probably not coming to my house to clean my kitchen. You're not coming to my house to clean my garage. You're not going to come to my house and do my yard work for me. That is my responsibility. Do you grasp, do you understand that these things are your personal, personal responsibility because it's your calling in Christ? When I do, I have to take them up. And in taking them up, it leads to me living in the reality of the oneness factor. Verse 4 and 5. This is very interesting. Because 4 and 5 gives a testimony to the fact that the person of the Trinity, the three persons of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, bring about a oneness and a unity to who I am, who the church is, and how it's all supposed to work. Look at what it says. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. I love this because what it says is that God is one and the church is to be one. And I am to be one with God and one with the church. And if anything is interfering with that, it doesn't work as it's supposed to. There are, these are really seven elements of unity centered on the three persons of the Trinity. One body. Let's talk about these. One body. That, is, that simply means one church, the universal church consisting of all believers. There's one spirit. That is the one Holy Spirit that lives within believers. There's only one. There's one hope that is only possible because of Jesus Christ. We were called to Jesus, our only hope of salvation. It's Jesus. And then he says, one Lord. There is only one Savior, that is Jesus Christ. Then to one faith, that is faith in Jesus Christ, our Savior. He is the way, the truth, and the life. In fact, when you go over to Jude chapter 3, you see that it is called, talking about the faith is called about a body of truth. And any truth we have, that's in Jesus then there's one baptism. There's the spiritual transfer that happens when we are baptized in the Spirit at salvation. Our sins are forgiven and the Spirit comes in. And then there's the physical baptism, the evidence. It is the outward symbol of the inward reality of a new life in Christ and our obedience to Him. There's only one baptism. And there's only one God. There's not many gods. There's one God. God the Father, who's over all and through all and in all. This is God the Father in his relationship to all believers. It's beautiful. It's powerful. The oneness factor. <laughs> Unity is a must. You know, it reminds me over in John chapter 13 where Jesus clearly gave the new command to the disciples that they were to love one another. And as they loved one another, they would display to the world in that oneness, what? That Jesus was the Messiah and they belonged to him. You can't escape that command. John 13, he said, you're to love one another. The love you have for one another will tell the world that I'm real. You said, no, I'm going to be in disunity with my brothers in Christ I'm going to disagree with them. I'm not going to love them. But I'm going to go out and tell the world that Jesus changed my life. You're getting ahead of the game. You're missing the whole point. You've got to start with your obedience to Jesus. He said this is a command. It's not a suggestion. It's a command. You have to love one another. The love you have for one another at that moment you're loving one another, you began to testify, radiate, communicate to other people that I'm real. But if you're not loving one another and you step out in the world and you try to tell people that Jesus 
is God's love message to them, they will not believe it because they cannot see it in your relationship with other people. See, this is where the church gets off uh, track. We think we're just going to do ministry, do truth, but never have to take personal responsibility for our expected expectations of our calling to God and to one another. See? And then I I thought about over in John 17 where Jesus prayed, Father, that they may be one, that the world may know that you sent me. Jesus prayed this, that there would be this oneness in the church among believers, and in that, then the world will see that God sent Jesus as Savior. Jesus prayed that. He called for it in the new command. See, in this love that we have for one another, because we are fulfilling our expected expectation of the calling to walk in a worthy manner, we manifest Christ. Christ is our testimony. He is the truth. He is the light. He is who the world needs. Christ is what matters. It's not my desires. It's not my will. It's not my way. Do you get the point? Do you see the difference? But when a church is not unified, a family's not unified, something's off. And typically the great challenge is when there's disunity, we begin to point fingers. We say, there's the reason. That's not right. I see that. I don't agree. Instead of saying, "Uh uh-oh, wait a minute, (laughs) wait a minute, wait a minute. If there's disunity, the first place we should point and look is like this, right back here, in the heart. You always go back to the beginning, the relationship with God, the expected expectation of living life in a worthy manner, fulfilling our calling. You begin, I begin, this is what I do. When there's disunity in relationships, and if it's in my home or if it's in the church, I go like this. Okay, Mark, are you being humble? Okay, Mark, are you being gentle? And I go through the list, and I ask myself those questions. Am I being unifying? Okay, Mark, and I check those things. Am I fulfilling my calling? Is this really about Jesus? Is it really about the church? Or is it something I want? Is this something that this is really more about me? Are my feelings hurt? Are my desires not being fulfilled? And if I can find that spot that's off in my heart, and I can adjust that, and I can go back to fulfilling my calling of being humble and going down through the whole list of being patient, whatever that is, and I can make that right, something amazing, miraculous begins to happen is that I now become a solution to the unity, not part of the disunity. I can honestly say that I'm walking in a way that is worthy. It's balanced. The calling and the conduct is balanced. And I can be assured that I'm bringing unity, not disunity. Because I am fully convinced. I am fully convinced That how I relate to people in my home, how I relate to people in the church is monumental to the testimony that goes forth to the world that Jesus is real and that God sent Jesus as the Son, the Messiah for all mankind. That's why. But if I become that it's about me and I want my way and I think I know it's right and I can't believe you don't believe as I believe and I battle and I draw a line and I say, come on, step across it. We'll settle this deal. Everybody loses every time. I'm not saying we're not standing for truth. We should and we must. Oh, man. See, too often when we talk about, and this is ultimately, I just want to remind you, I said this at the beginning, and I'll say it many times, but what we're working on here in this new series is that we're trying to understand the connection between relationships and making disciples, right? 
So if we're going to make disciples, we're going to have impact, radical impact out here in the world. We've got to make sure that we're not just focusing on uh, methods and training that say, we're going to get this done if we do it this way, and we train enough, and we go out enough. Listen, that's good. There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, I'm going to do some training with you, and I'm going to talk about some methods, and that's fine. But it cannot supersede back here, number one, my relationship with God. And then number two, my relationship uh, with others in the home and in the church so that there's the picture of unity and love and humility and grace and all those things so that it begins to testify to the world as I go out, I am a credible witness to them that they can have what they see in my corporate relationships, in my home relationships, and in my personal relationships, that it's valid. Now, we can't do that in a mathematical problem, one plus one equals two. We do it out of obedience, trust that God puts forth the testimony, but in the purity of our hearts, in the feeling and knowing of the unity, we have this incredible confidence and leadership of the Holy Spirit to go out into the world and make an impact, trusting that He's using the testimony as He desires. But it all goes back to, there's some basic responsibilities, the expected expectation that's on me, that's my responsibility. Over the holidays, Michelle's brother, uh, we were visiting with him, and uh, he has two young daughters, and one of those, the older of the two, is starting to get into running in school, going to run track and cross country. And so we got to talking about running, and um, she's young, and she's just growing and learning in the sport, and she said, will you give me some tips? I know you ran a marathon. I said, I did. I said, I'm not a professional coach, but I can, I can maybe show you some things that will be helpful to you. I said, if you go out, and we, and we set up a time to go out the next day and go running. I said, if I can watch you run, I can see some of the things that I may be able to say to you that will be helpful to you. And so we went out, and we ran the next day, and um, I initially began to watch her and saw some things right off that I could show her that would be helpful to her. So I began to coach her, and I began to, during the five-mile run that we took that day, I began to walk her through what her responsibilities ought to be to be able to run in a worthy way, in a way that she gets the most benefit, in a way that she wouldn't damage her body and have injury. And so I really believe if she carried on the way she was running, their injury would have come, and she wouldn't be as efficient as she could be. But we began to talk through some of those responsibilities, and I won't go into all of them for you, but I'll give you some of them just to make this point in this story, in this illustration. One of the first things I told her, I said, you got to have light arms, light hands. I said, don't Grip your fist really tight because what that does, that uh, makes your arm tight, your shoulders tight. You tighten everything up. You don't want that. You want to have light arms. You want to have light hands. A lot of people will do a, a, something like this or something like this or, or something like that just to keep the fingers from gripping like this. So you want light hands. You want your arms to flow with your run and be relatively tight. You don't want, want what they call crazy arms where your arms are all over the place. So we talked about this part. And then I said, secondly, you need to listen to your feet. You want not just light hands and arms, you want light feet. You don't want to slap the pavement. And so we began to listen. I said, what do your feet sound like? I said, listen to your feet, now listen to my feet. And she was slapping the pavement. I said, now I want you to run a little lighter. I want you to imagine that you're floating. And so now we have light hands, light feet. Now I said, the next thing you've got to do is you've got to focus on your posture. She goes, what do you mean? I said, if you're running looking at the ground, it pulls your shoulders down. And if you pull your shoulders down, it, it collapses in on your lungs, and your lungs can't get the oxygen that it needs. You've got to have your shoulders back. You've got to have your head up so that as you breathe, and we talked about the importance of how to breathe when you're running, your body is getting the oxygen that it needs so that the blood can get the oxygen. It can flow through your system and get down to your muscles and the extremities that need that. But if you're hunched over like this, running like this down, your breathing is not proper. So we talked about light hands, light feet. We talked about the proper posture. And then we talked about where to look and how to have the right vision of how to look ahead of where you're going and goals that you have. Then we talked about the mental part of running. 
And we walked through a number of those things. And so we worked over those five miles. We worked on those things. And at the end of it, I said to her, I said, now these are your responsibilities. These are things only you can do now that you've learned them. And there are about five of those. Just like there are here in the Scripture. There are five things that you and I are called to do. There are responsibilities. Now we can go out and we can run the Christian life, but if we are not humble, if we are not gentle, if we are not patient, if we are not loving, and we are not unifying, we will not run with efficiency, I promise you. We can run, but we're going to cause injury to ourselves, we're not going to be as efficient, and we are going to probably hurt other people in the long run. Too many believers just get out there and go, well, I'm saved, and I'm going to go live my life. I don't know how it's going to turn out, but I want what I want. And yes, I'm saved, and I'm going to heaven. We've got to stop. And we've got to say, I have a responsibility. I have an expected expectation, a worthy calling on my life that I've got to fulfill. And I've got to go through the checklist to make sure I'm running this way. That's really what he's saying in the text. We went in the house later that day, and I said, I want you to write those things down. So she flipped over a piece of paper where we had put down a running schedule, and she wrote out, light hands, light feet. And she wrote down all five of those things that I gave her. Now I said, I want you to learn those. I want you to go over them before you go out and run each day. And I want you to run in such a way that you can run effectively and efficiently. But that choice is up to her. You know, I don't know what she's done over the last several days and how she's been running. That's up to her. I don't know how you're going to live when you leave here, but you know what? That's up to you. Should you do it? The Bible says you should. Should I do it? The Bible says I should. And if I do it, what will happen? You're going to be unified. The oneness factor. The testimony is going to go forth. God's going to use you in a powerful way. But it all starts in our hearts. What do you think? You think you should? I pray you do. I know I need to. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you. It makes such perfect sense when we trust you and we do it your way. I think one of the most basic of basic things you told us, that if anybody's going to come after you, you've got to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. It's in denying ourselves, Lord, that all these things begin to happen for us. As we move forward this year, I pray our homes would be sweeter, stronger, based on your truth than ever before. I pray our people in their personal walk, Lord, would be in such step and unity with you that the Spirit can move them wherever and however you desire for your glory. And as a church, Lord, as we are unified, God, that the world will just see there's something different in us. And I pray we'll go forth and be different makers for your glory. So would you work in our lives as we start this new year. In church, I invite you to come. The altar's open. Let God work in your heart. It's a new day every day with the Lord. Let's start it right with him for his glory. You come. If you want to come pray as a family, you want to come as an individual, the altar is open. May God be honored. Again, just to reiterate, the altar is open, and we want you to use this time just to <clears throat> be in prayer, and just to ask the Lord to solidify what he's been teaching you this morning. Um, but before we do this next song, I just wanted to introduce it a little bit and just kind of tell you what it means to me. Um, 2020 was a tough year for a lot of us um, and for a lot of people that we know and that we love. Um, and so... I think what the Lord was trying to do is is he was trying to teach us, he was trying to mold us, he was trying to shape us to look more like him. And so um, I was brought to this song a few months ago, um, and I just want to give you a little bit of a background from it. It's primarily based out of the book of Jeremiah, and the big premise of it um, comes from chapter 18. Um, and in verse 1 of Jeremiah chapter 18, it says, This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Go down at once to the potter's house. There I will reveal my words to you. So I went down to the potter's house, and there he was, working away at the wheel. But the jar he was making from the clay became flawed in the potter's hand. 
So he made it into another jar as it seemed right for him to do. The word of the Lord came to me, house of Israel, can I not treat you as the potter treats his clay? This is the Lord's declaration, just like clay in the potter's hands, so are you in my hand, house of Israel. As believers in Christ, when we surrender our life, we say, all right, Lord, here's my life, and I'm going to put my life in your hands. And our heart and our attitude toward God in that moment should be, whatever your will, whatever your way is for my life, my life is in your hands, and I want to reflect you. And I want you to shape me. I want you to mold me into who you're calling me to be. And so I hope that this gives you a perspective of our relationship to the Lord and how we are his possession as we enter into 2021 and as challenges come and things go awry. I pray that this perspective helps you remember that we need to be like clay in the potter's hands. And in my mother's womb You formed me with your hand Known and loved by you Before I took a breath When I doubted Lord remind me I'm wonderfully made you're an artist and a potter. I'm the canvas and the clay. And you make all things work together for my future and for my good. You make all things work together. For your glory and for your name, there's a healing light just beyond the clouds. Though I've walked through the fire, I see clearly now when I nothing has been wasted, no failure or mistake. Cause you're an artist and a potter on the canvas and the clay. And you make all things work together.
color I'm the canvas and the clay And I know nothing has been waiting